I can. Because the bulletin boards were magical and the angels sang. <laughs> 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 um, I wanted to be a teacher so bad from that day. I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And that was my pursuit all through K-12. I got to college and I hated the elementary education program so much. I was like, no, I really just learned this math. <laughs> I don't want to learn this math again. And really, why can't you throw a football? What's wrong with you? Um, so it was not my jam, and I'm a little rough around the edges for elementary anyway. So I started into secondary. I went and taught for a semester in rural Mexico for the Instituto Nacional de Educación de Adultos. So that thing? Yeah, yeah, Inea. I taught in Salisinla in the state of Puebla. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so it was a program where we taught adults um, literacy and basic numeracy and mathematics in Spanish. Uh, and then I also taught in the local middle school. So I taught my students to say, teacher, you are a skinny. Yeah. <laughs> I walked across town and they would like yell it at me. I was like, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of when life happened to me. So there was a really cute boy and he was like, you should not go and get your teaching certificate. Uh, you should marry me instead. So I did, <sighs> which was cool. And I have two kids. My daughter's 20. Her junior recital in opera is Saturday, if anybody wants to attend up at the U. She's spectacular. Uh, and my son is 16 and a junior in high school. So they all happened to me. In the midst of all of this, I stumbled on it and Right? So... I had some history working at the library as a student, and so I had some relationships with faculty already, and so I was kind of hired into what was then called the Center for Instructional Design. It is now something else. Center for Teaching and Learning. There you go. Woo um, so I was doing some work for them. I see Yvette. We were colleagues together there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just kind of stumbled into that, and from there started my graduate work and was able to complete graduate work, had a baby per degree, Almost got kicked out because I stopped working because postpartum depression sucks. Yeah, so all of that. Um, but was able to get through, thanks to Charles and Peter and so many other wonderful people who helped me with that. So got my PhD in 2008. And you can see what my projects were, my, my thesis and dissertation. So for my master's degree, really surveying and talking to instructional designers, people who had graduated from instructional design programs like IPNT across the US about kind of what their preparation had been like, the different classes that they had to take, what their preparation was like, and then how that translated into practice in the field. So if you need a nap, great read. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we worked, many of us together, and Charles and I in particular, on a conceptual analysis of TPAC, so technological pedagogical content knowledge for teachers, um, helping to kind of clarify those definitions. It was shortly after Kayla and Mishra's um, initial paper came out, 2006, 2005 was when that work was first coming out. And so I completed my project in 2008. So we kind of were clarifying those definitions, coming up with exemplars, things like that. So obviously my life has kind of always been around the education space because of my like, I wanted to be a teacher so bad. But we found ways to make it work. So that's kind of where I got to the PhD. So then I, I was able to jump in while I was still a doc student to working at UVU, at the time UVSC, Utah Valley State College. Um, and I was hired the day I started teaching, legit. <laughs> they were like, oh crap, we need an adjunct. Can you come? And then they, I, I signed my hiring paperwork and walked into my classroom for the first time. Uh, and at the time it was a packet class, like we're talking old school back in the day, right? When you came to, it was more of a community college, state college feel where you came in, they gave you a packet. You could go through it as fast as you wanted to. So I kind of inherited that system. And my perspective was really, isn't tech so fun? Like all the kids do the tech and we should do the tech because the kids do the tech. 
And then I was able to transition to lecture as we moved toward university status. So it was a year before we transitioned to university status, I was moved to a lecturer position. So full-time, half the salary, but do all the work. It's a great deal, <laughs> super awesome. Um, and then I moved to the tenure track right as we moved to university status. Just so you know, my dissertation was what we would fondly call a death march. So between <laughs> from my defense of my prospectus to my defense of my dissertation was nine months. Don't do it. Yeah. It turned out all right. <laughs> Again, thanks to my team. As I started into my tenure track position, my training in ed psych led me to teaching that course as well as educational technology. And working with one of my colleagues, I got really immersed in adolescent psychology, um, adolescent development. And when you start looking at what we then had as very loose correlational data around, and it still is frankly, loose correlational data around the use of technology and adolescent development, that is not a happy place, right? <laughs> as we see that kids who, are already struggling with severe identity issues and emotional, you know, like self-esteem issues and those kinds of things, step into digital spaces and some of the things that can happen within those digital spaces. They can also find beautiful communities and a stronger sense of purpose and identity, but for a lot of kids, it's a dangerous place to be, right? So that was my wait, what the heck moment. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? Why am I standing here advocating for us to use more and more technology when we're not even sure? of the impact that it's having on kids. So that's the point at which I kind of stepped away from the ed tech field, became very much immersed in the field of adolescent psychology, um, developmental psychology, brain development, so developmental neuroscience kinds of things. Um, and yeah, there was some interesting ground to cover in there, right? When you look at those patterns of brain development and you know that those frontal lobes and the ability to kind of parse fact from fiction and reality from whatever <laughs> virtual reality at this point, um, their ability to regulate emotion, to project forward, what, if, what is or how is what I'm doing right now going to affect me in the future? All of that stuff is not developed yet in adolescence. And then we're putting them in this space where they're seeing right now, Ukraine crisis, Ukraine crisis, there we go. And my 16 year old son said to me yesterday, I don't, I know I should stay up on it, but I don't feel like I want to, right? He's recognizing the emotional toll that that takes on him to see things happening across the world. That, you know, I had to do newspaper clippings in my seventh grade history class to find out about the war or the wall falling in Berlin, right? This was a challenge to find current events across the world. And for my son, it's like, I think I need to shut it out. It's not helping me right now. So there was a lot around that. And so I started really looking more at the deeper ways in which we can use technology, right? Can we use that understanding of developmental psychology and the realization of that development of identity and the fact that they're not yet critical thinkers to the extent we hope them to be, right? Can we then leverage technology in a way that they're finding, discovering, exploring, and expressing their identities using technology, that they're finding passion and purpose through technology and not sometimes, right? That we're a kind of getting them to think critically and evaluate sources and all that kind of stuff. So those deeper purposes rather than the, let's play another Kahoot, okay? So 2014-15 um, was a really big turnaround year for me. You're all like, I was three, shut up. <laughs> so um, <laughs> one thing that happened then was I um, was hired to teach as an hourly teacher at Lake Ridge Junior High. So I would teach in the mornings on A days. This got very confusing, by the way. It's fine, I lived through it. Um, so I'd teach in the mornings on A days at Lake Ridge, two class periods. And then I would go and teach my undergraduate students at UVU throughout the day. And then I taught graduate classes at night. My brain was like, what now? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. 
Also, AB day is different from the standard university schedule of like Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday. So I might have missed a couple of my university classes. It's fine. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so starting to draw some parallels. Okay. So I taught at a middle school in rural Mexico. It was gorgeous. And I loved it. It was what's called a telesecundaria. So they watch TV and that's where their instruction was. And then they had a facilitator in the class who would give them quizzes and things like that to check their mastery. Okay. Then they went home and they had perhaps a radio that they had access to. Okay. So this was 1998. I'm old. Okay, sorry. Sorry about the swearing in German. <laughs> Son's fault. Okay. Um, so even then we were starting to see how powerful the internet could be for education, for opportunity for folks, right? And so sitting there as a very young adult starting to say, wait a second, these kids in my classroom in Mexico will not have the same opportunities as kids from where I was from in Oregon. It wasn't going to happen super concerning that realization that it just was not gonna happen for those kids. Um, and my kids living in a very remote rural village really didn't even aspire to going to university, right? It was very much an agrarian culture where everybody stayed intergenerationally, which is wonderful, don't get me wrong, right? But as far as having access to information and opportunities and things like that. So tying that into my experience at Lake Ridge, don't tell Alpine District I'm telling you this. So again, 2014-15, I taught two classes. So one of my classes, we identified the 19 most, and I hate this label, but it's what they were labeled at the time. So they're the most at-risk kids coming out of sixth grade. And we were defining at-risk at that point, not necessarily as academic, but as socio-emotional. Okay? So we were picking the 19 kids, that was the number it ended up being, that whose sixth grade teachers said, we're really worried about this kid. We put them all in my class. It was so awesome. Yeah, it was a little scary at first. Go ahead. What was the name of this class? It was called Leap. Oh, okay, okay. So it was specifically for challenge. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, How much did they pay you to do this? <laughs> <laughs> um, hourly teacher pay. Yeah, it was awesome which they forced on me. <laughs> so I was like, I just want to come be with middle schoolers because I have a weird love for middle schoolers. But um, so what we did was in that class, we built, it was basically all socio-emotional curriculum. So we were looking at what are your strengths? And spoiler alert, when you grow up in a place where your parents are going to jail and siblings are going to jail and you've lived in your car on the street and those kinds of things, competition. Is a very strong strength among these kids, um, but also compassion, right? So I had them, and then the second class period that I taught was pretty much the exact opposite. It was a class called Peer Mentors. So our Peer Mentor class, it was all about empathy. How do you empathize with kids who have not had the kinds of advantages you've had, who are not as academically proficient as you are? And then we paired the kids in that peer mentor class with the kids who are in remedial English classes, they would actually go into the class, sit down with them, not to tutor, but to model what it looked like to be a good student in that situation, to have buddy conversations. They were peer, or paired with another kid the whole time. Um, yeah, so, so very different, but very cool experiences both. What I got a lot of in that context, um, I was told repeatedly that my kids in my first period class, my LEAP kids, could not use technology in a meaningful way, that they were only capable of using it for remediation, drill and kill. My classroom had a projector that I had to sit Miguel next to so he could wiggle the mouse every once in a while. So the projector didn't go to sleep. And that was the extent of the technology in my classroom. Whereas the honors class downstairs, had one-to-one -one iPads and they were making videos and, right? So that culture of expectation was reflected in that classroom. And you're seeing the parallels I'm drawing, right? My kids who are already at a severe disadvantage around their socioeconomic and their socio-emotional conditions, now we're being deprived of 
digital literacy skills that could prepare them for a better future than they had. That's the same as I saw in Mexico. So that perspective on equity and then starting to do the research around what are those digital divides now, not with regard to access, because almost every one of my kids had a cell phone, but with regard to usage and understanding of the purpose and, and the possibilities within that device. That's where we now see that divide. Charles? So Cindy, I was just wondering, was that like a conscious decision that Alpine District made or the school made? And if so, why, like, why, were it, like, why did they make that? decision to have kind of a rich environment in one context but an impoverished environment in the other. Yeah. So part of it is understanding the the behemoth that is Alpine District, right? So Alpine District has almost 90,000 students in it at this point. So before the pandemic, they were not even quite a two to one district. So so they had not quite one device per two kids. And it would vary greatly from school to school. So we had schools in Alpine that were one-to-one -one or more. We had schools in Alpine that had a teacher computer in the room and you hope for the best, right? Lots of disparities from school to school. Lake Ridge Junior in particular, um, obviously at the time, blended learning was not a focus of their pedagogy. So the honors teacher had taken it upon herself to get that. To get a grant. Yep. Their, the remedial classes, the English classes um, had Chromebooks, mostly for Mastery Connect. So witnessing classes in which they said, okay, let's pull up your Mastery Connect data. I can see that y'all are not yet proficient on introductory sentences. So we are gonna drill introductory sentences, <laughs> right? So really, I mean, it was uh, this lack of vision of where are we going to be five years from now and what do our kids need and resources yeah yeah so it wasn't necessarily administrators telling me we're not giving you anything but the teachers in the honors classes were the teachers that had the most initiative exactly. to get it correct yeah. Some longevity there yeah 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 because they were of course you know the 20 plus year veteran teachers that, that got into those positions so so I may have stolen some things from UVU and taken them up there and borrowed some surplus and whatever so we we did we made movies I asked the kids to make movies about how they've overcome barriers in their lives and we did all kinds of great things our final project for our leap class was a public service announcement so we went through a concept attainment lesson where they saw examples and non-examples of public service announcements. So they figured out what the attributes were. And then they picked a topic they felt was important there at the school. So we got ones on fighting and bullying and whatever was happening with trash in the lunchroom that year. Hmm. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and then my kids spent time, they had to develop, they had to do research on statistics around bullying in schools or fighting or whatever it was. Um, they had to develop a script or a set of questions to do interviews. They uh, filmed their movies. They edited their movies. We created a competition board. You guys remember? Mm -hmm. yes. So they had a competition board for their teams to track who had done what step and how far along they were in the process, but they were the ones doing all of that work. Um, their videos at the end were displayed in the lunchroom over the TVs that were there. And then we had a family night that we invited people to come to. When you think about our at-risk population, what's your initial concern, your knee-jerk concern about a family night? So 18 of my 19 kids came and their extended families. We filled the library, okay? Not on me, but it's the idea of project-based learning as a powerful pedagogy, right? That the kids owned these and they knew it and they felt proud of them. And they stood up with their artist statements, read them, 13-year-olds. <laughs> uh, but a powerful moment, right? And the other thing I haven't told you is that we lied to all the kids, <laughs> kind of. Um, we told them and their parents at the back to school night before the semester started that their child had been chosen to be in the class because their teacher had identified them as having leadership potential. 
which they had, they were just leading in maybe not the direction we wanted them to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, pretty cool stuff. 18 is a 19 graduated from high school two years ago. So we're super proud of that. But it was just, it was a home base. It was a place to be themselves. And we played soccer every Friday and they did genius hour. So we'd play soccer for 15 or 20 minutes and then they'd go do genius hour and do Minecraft and program and figure out how to draw Batman. I don't know, they had some weird ones. <laughs> it's <was> kind of cool. <laughs> Did this impact their ability to enroll in their own classes? Too? Yeah, so they we were expecting, I'm trying to remember the exact statistics, but it was super dramatic. So our administrators were expecting a combined total of 70 plus Fs from our students after the first semester, uh, and there were fewer than 20. So we had conversations around, you know, you take ownership. If you need to redo an assignment, if you need to take a buddy, and we told the other teachers, if our students show up with a buddy to have a conversation with you, it's okay. <laughs> but go with your buddy and say, hey, I really need to retake that. We practiced having conversations. We did service projects. So we did Socktober. Kid President was our favorite person of all time. We watched every <laughs> video ever made from Kid, kid President. <laughs> yeah, but it did. It trickled out to their academics. And, and like I said, 18 of the 19 graduated. So super exciting. So seeing that, um, and then kind of all, all at the same time, this is all like hitting me. Uh, I was able to attend my first workshop on universal design for learning. Familiar concept? Yeah. Yes, sort of. Okay. Um, so that again is another place where you're seeing, oh wait, technology isn't a flashy, fun engagement tool. I mean, you can use it for that. But it's first, how do we narrow that digital divide around competencies and literacies and preparation for the future on the one side? And kids don't even know the tools they could start using to empower their own learning. You mean I can do Google Translate and have it at least approximated <laughs> in my, my home language? You mean I can have text-to-speech and I can listen to it instead of reading it? You mean I can turn on Beeline Reader and it can use the dyslexia specific font and change the background color of the page for me, right? Like not even knowing that these tools exist. So those two things happening together, we're like, okay, I'm back. We can do this. So at that point, now I'm a tenured professor. See how much money I make? Back. Yeah, one bag of money. <laughs> I did not bother to change any of the icons in this presentation. All right. So, <laughs> um, so about five years ago, so so just after this experience and seeing these kinds of things, my um, colleague Krista Ruggles and I started the Creative Learning Studio at UBU. So the Creative Learning Studio is in the School of Education. It is specifically around equity, professional development, and pre-service teacher education in computer science, robotics, computational thinking. Um, yeah. And then we have a lending library so teachers can check out class kits of robotics if their school can't afford to have them in their school. So we started all of that. Just when it was taking off. Yeah. <laughs> was, your, was your time at Lake Ridge like a, you know, obviously wasn't a sabbatical. Nope. And it was just one year? Yeah, a year and a half. Yeah, so I did the peer mentors class for a half year to like, they brought me in in January to do the second semester of one. And then I taught through the whole next year. Yeah. In part to kind of reconnect with like kids, kids in K-12 <laughs> setting, yeah. been in the higher ed setting for so long. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> or her sabbatical. Yes, which I haven't even mentioned. That's true. <laughs> you skipped it right between these two. So Yeah, so sabbatical 2018-19, I went up and worked with the STEM Action Center um, up in Salt Lake. I was the evaluator for the uh, Computing Partnerships Grants Program for a year, um, and then just working extensively with schools and everybody I could find around advocacy in computational thinking and computer science. Oh, yeah, and brought the CS for All conference to Utah for the first time. Yes. 
So do you see how bizarro my life has been? Are you seeing this? Okay, good. Uh, in there somewhere too is some instructional design consultation work I did take for one year during my tenure track position. I was half time an instructional design consultant for a distance education department, helping them start to venture into the land of online education. Um, so yeah, just like whatever. Okay, you're absolutely right. Look, then this happened. <laughs> okay, so here's the secret. When this happened, so I was at the USET conference, the Utah Coalition for Educational Technology Conference with 1,500 of my closest friends. And they said, there's a pandemic and we're gonna shut all the things down and we're all looking at each other like, don't touch me. We was there, we were doing sessions together. It was that week, yeah. Yeah, it was bizarro. Um, but, and maybe some of y'all feel the same way. I was like, I was born for this moment. Because <laughs> I had this training behind me, right? So I was like, I've been an instructional designer. I've developed online courses. Like, I've been in ed tech since before ed tech. <laughs> Do this. I know. I'm such a absurd, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was actually, I mean, it was an interesting moment to be able to say, like, no, I got this. And like, help my colleagues and that kind of thing. It was so weird. But but having been trained and being prepared for it made me that much more flexible to be able to say, okay, not how we envisioned this, hit it. Yeah. But it also brought all kinds of challenges, right? So suddenly you can tell I'm an in-class kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was teaching online for a year and a half. I was fully online in my craft room, my ironing board at the back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which was fine, like I and I developed what I feel is like the most beautiful educational psychology class of all time. Better than yours, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, using anchored instruction, which I learned from our old friend here. I'm going to forget his name now, but he passed away a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway. By the way, it gives a scholarship to the department every year. It's family. Oh my gosh. From the grave. He gives <laughs> from the grave. Olin would do that, actually. I can see him doing that extending beyond the grave. Um, so yeah, I had a great online class, but I was sitting teaching online for a year and a half. Um, I also, I was telling Jason, made the horrible mistake of being elected chair of tenure for all of UVU. Yeah. Was their rank and status committee? Yeah. Which is when you start to see kind of some of the gross underbelly political stuff of a university life, which your professors don't want you to know about. Um, underbelly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not here. <laughs> yeah, even more here. Yeah. So um, that's where you found me in October of 2021. Okay, was sitting in my craft room, <laughs> looking at people's tenure portfolios and appeals because they didn't get tenure and their career's about to end. Okay. And the meanwhile. So I live in Provo. My kids have gone to Provo schools. Um, so I, as a parent, was seeing what was happening in my kids' education, right? So many sweet, amazing teachers who are trying their darndest to do something powerful for kids. But so many of them didn't have the training I had, right? Um, and there are a few other things too. I'm gonna bring up a guest in a second. From a teacher educator perspective, I'd spent the last 16 years of my career teaching people about powerful educational concepts, how to use technology in meaningful ways, the importance of developing identity and being student-centered in your teaching. And then I saw my students go out into classrooms and be at the mercy of whatever the culture was in the district in the school, right? So I felt like I'd been putting all this effort into developing great teachers. And then some of them landed in a place where they could flourish. And some of them landed in a place where they're like, no, that's not how we do it. 
Okay, so I'm bringing out my special guest for a minute because um, Tina is a teacher in my district. I cartooned you! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so Tina, if you just take a minute to tell us what the last two years have been like as a teacher in Provo District. Sense of vision from the district um, and what it's just been like for you overall. We're throwing all the districts under the bus today. I need to censor this? Is yeah. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's what's in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I am very much a classroom teacher. I am an arts integrator as a teacher. And so I need my kids in my classroom. And um, being told overnight that I had to move to an online setting was heartbreaking for me. Not that my kids didn't know how to have, and we had in my classroom actually one-to-one -one technology, which was a blessing, um, but that I knew that my students, their home lives were such that it would not be conducive for learning. And we also knew that when we sent these Chromebooks home with our students, that several of them did not even have internet access into their homes. And we still have 16% of our student population who don't. Um, and so that whole part was very hard. The other part is that my classroom has 80% English learners. And so their parents can't even read the instructions that I put on the Chromebook in order to tell their kid how to do what they needed to do. So um, we did Google Classroom all of a sudden used it before because it didn't need it mm -hmm. um or so you thought yeah <laughs> <laughs> created online content that we thought would be helpful for students and um we thought the kids would be back in two weeks so we also sent paper packets things that they were used to doing in classroom were on autopilot doing and we could come back together and have a great discussion in two weeks so when we went Full time, never coming back. I went from a Google Classroom of a read aloud and a little math instruction um, via whatever that was Zoom. Zoom. Yep. Oh yeah. Um, with seven of my twenty students to four of my twenty students. So I ended my classroom, my class that year. 15% of my students. And of that 15%, one of them did come from a very, um, a parent who could speak English um, and very supportive, but she was self-driven and the rest of them were English speaking. So I really did lose everybody else. Come into the new school year, kids coming half time every other day for half time. Everybody else is on, uh, a learning day, we get Canvas as teachers, we get a new math curriculum as teachers, we get a new science curriculum as teachers, and we're supposed to be able to juggle all the ball at once. And um, me as a teacher, I failed. I, I, I couldn't put in enough time. Even though that we had two hours of prep every day, um, of that was you know sanitizing your classroom and trying to keep kids separated and um but through that one of the things that um i as a facilitator of professional learning at my school found is that we only needed to really master three techniques of distance learning over um, the virtual space and that for me took my stress level from way up here that I had to learn all these new things to way down here. And I disseminated that to my teachers, just learn three things, yeah. how to make a video, how to get the kids to learn how to make a video, use Flipgrid or whatever you want to teach them with when they're live with you so that they can be successful at home. Um, and then at one other way that they can interact and I chose Nearpod. So, when the kids were with me, 
giving instruction, but also giving them opportunities to mess with those things in class so that I could troubleshoot with them so that when they were home in that virtual space, they felt more comfortable and would access. I would say about 50% accessed. Um, and so have I answered all your questions? Yeah. Okay. That was my expert. So first of all, here in the media all the time, this has been real hard for teachers. <laughs> it's been real hard for teachers, right? And it's compounded if you're not, don't have a communicated, shared, clear vision. So what she's skipping over is that teachers were told, elementary, you can use Google Classroom. Secondary, we need you to use Canvas. Otherwise, here's a link to the page that has 1,600 district approved apps that you could use if you'd like to teach your classes. Good luck. Why? Because we just didn't have personnel in place. So our last digital learning coach retired the October before the pandemic. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Jeez, <Ken. laughs> um, Our person who had been over what they called at the time the Innovative Learning Initiative, which was kind of an opportunity to get some Chromebooks and explore tools, basically, right? He was moved into a run Canvas for us position. That was it. That was the extent of their ed tech support. Okay. So not to, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. I'm saying this is the position they were in. So their networking was awesome. They worked with the community to get hotspots and things like that for the majority of kids. They went one-to-one -one faster than any other district in the state. But as far as what the vision was and what tools to use and how to do things effectively, that piece was just not there. So that was what I was seeing from the parent side. It was like, oh my goodness, these poor teachers are trying so hard, but they don't have the guidance to get there. They don't have the support to get there. Um, so literally in October of 21, superintendent called me up, said, hey, would you come in and do just a consultation with us? So sat down at the table with them. They were like, we really need an evaluation of kind of where we are and a vision for where we're going. I was like, okay, that's a lot of work. <laughs> They're like, but we'll pay you. I'm like, no, that's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, and then I asked, so, and then who do you have on staff who's going to carry forward that vision? They're like, oh yeah, we should hire somebody. <laughs> that would be <laughs> so anyway, by the end of the day, that was turned into a job offer. One day. So I was a tenured professor. <laughs> and within a day, it was like, do you want to come work for a district? But it was my district. They're my kids' teachers. It's my brother who works at one of the elementary schools. They're my neighbors, literally. Like, and I've seen what they went through. So, okay. so that's kind of what I'm stepping into. So I'm director of innovative learning. So what I've done is taken Canvas. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> All anything ed tech, um, our K-12 computer science initiative our blended learning and self-directed learning initiatives, and we're moving into our personalized competency-based learning someday initiative. Things that are coming from the state that have to do with innovating our school systems. Those are all under my purview at this point. So I've been in the position for a whopping two and a half months. <laughs> About once every three weeks, I have a moment when I'm just like, <laughs> but I've never once turned the wrong direction to go to work which if you know me, <laughs> is big, because I'm always up in here. Yeah, always up in here. Okay, so um, this is where we can get into a little bit of like, what does this mean for you? You are moving into a place of change, whatever that is. You can't just go in and start changing things, right? So I joke in my position, I was joking today with some folks, I am the bull in the china shop. That is my role at the moment. So I stumble into situations, I'm like, why do we do that? <laughs> and if people can't answer me, that's telling, right? So that's kind of my role at this point. Um, but this is what I'm in the process of analyzing. So Noster's model for managing complex change helps us understand how we go about making massive improvements over time. 
Okay. So what I'm in the process of doing as part of my evaluation is identifying which pieces are missing. And along the way, I'm finding in different places in each of these initiatives I'm trying to juggle, different pieces are missing. But fairly consistency, the vision is missing. So we moved to digital. We knew we needed to do that. But now what? Right? I'm getting a lot of, well, oh, good. We don't need blended anymore. Wrong. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back to that UDL. Let's go back to that digital equity. What are the literacy skills our kids need? Because if we move back and out of digital learning, we're depriving them of something they're going to need for their future. But where's the vision for that? So I'm literally in the process of like writing pieces for our district news and creating a video explaining why we made certain decisions, right? Even though I didn't make them because I wasn't there, but going back and back filling that vision. And then going forward, transparency is one of my key values. You will know what we're doing and why we're doing it well in advance, and you'll have input into that decision. What are the skills that we're missing? So when I have teachers telling me, so yeah, our poor elementary teachers, one year was, we're told Google Classroom, the next year we're kind of told Canvas. So they're madly switching their curriculum over. Some of them were like, no, <laughs> we're not switching over. Um, and so when they tell me Canvas is developmentally inappropriate for kids, or you can't do this on Canvas, a lot of the times what I'm finding is it's a lack, it's skill gap, that they don't know how to do certain things within a, a given platform, right? So we're building, working on developing professional development to build up those skills. This means I'm having to walk back some promises that were made. So we have a statewide grant that said, we were gonna start in on robust self-directed learning for students. And I'm like, well, before we do that, <laughs> let's build some basic competencies for our teachers in a core set of technologies. Canvas, Nearpod, Google, we just get those three. And then, <laughs> and then we can move forward in finding those tools that are supportive. And we have you know, state contracts and things like that that we can leverage, Canva, Adobe. Why are we looking at hundreds of different tools when we can start with core competency in a few and build from there, right? Um, then we can start talking about what good blended learning looks like because we have the competency to build it. Then we can start looking at what self-directed learning in a blended learning environment looks like. So pulling back those layers and saying, what's missing from here? Incentives, man, every teacher I've talked to, so that's been my job for the last two and a half months, go to schools and say, tell me, what have the last couple of years been like for you? What do you need? What do you think they tell me? Money. No, it's not money. Okay. <laughs> it's time for new things on our plate. Yeah. And time to no focus. more initiatives and time to do what we need to do. It's either money or feeling appreciated with the time and resources. Like it can be. It can be both, yeah. You can work for money and not be appreciated, but yeah. if you're not getting paid, which most teachers aren't, then you want to feel appreciated and supported and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely, That's right? So I'm hearing time, hands down, number one, please somehow give us time. The legislature just passed a bill, we'll see how it comes out, <laughs> giving us more days to do professional development before the school year begins. We'll see how that plays out. I don't know how it's gonna play out, but, um, but yeah, we've gotta be really mindful of that. Yes, compensation is nice. So I can reroute some of my grant funds that were being used to purchase hardware. We can develop a new sustainability plan for the hardware piece. And we can say, okay, now how do we incentivize teachers? Can we provide um, you know, reimbursements for micro-credentialing and certifications that we're getting? Can we you know, provide hourly compensation for participation in professional learning? All of that kind of stuff. But if they don't care about the professional learning, it won't matter. And if they don't feel valued for having completed it, they, it won't matter, right? So as we go up, just making sure that each of these are in place and an action plan that's actually feasible to get that work done. So this morning we had a, grant, a meeting, should we go for this state grant for personalized competency-based learning? And at the end of the meeting, we all looked at each other and said, we need a planning year before the planning year, right? Because we don't have an action plan in place to do this. So we would be planning on the fly what we're trying to get done. So backing things up, going slow to go fast. Okay. Um, we already talked about all this stuff. I love my bitmojis, sorry. 
Um, so what am I taking away or what sustained me basically and helped me from this program? My instructional design skills, holy crap. Okay, so if you can do a design project, do a design project because I've, I've used it in so many different areas of my career. My ad psych background is super invaluable. Like even now being able to go in and be like, how do I motivate a teacher to participate in a professional learning activity? I know they need a sense of autonomy. I know they need a sense of belonging and I know that they need to feel confident in what they're doing. So how do I develop that within this framework? Right, please. You should, so you used the pre-mac principle with your kids earlier. Right? Uh -huh. We, we, we told them that, you know, they were special. Right. right. You can pull the teachers out and do the same thing. Absolutely. Right? Like, hey, we identified you as a, a bloomer this year. <laughs> oh, I've been pulling the ones that are already confident. This is brilliant. <laughs> you know, talk to the principals and, and, and say, hey, talk to your principal and said that we have some latent technology skills. Well, you didn't tell me. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> I, I'm going over my time, so if y'all need to leave, that's cool. But um, as weird as it sounds, because TPAC is kind of a in it's a kind of a theoretical principle as we look at what are the domains of teacher knowledge and how they overlap and how they manifest in a classroom. Not understanding that would have killed my career from the beginning, right? Because you have to understand this junction of how technology, content knowledge, and classroom pedagogies come together or online pedagogies come together to make any headway in what we're trying to do. Um, and then thank goodness for my evaluation training, right? To be able to go in and have kind of a process to go through of developing protocols and implementing those protocols and analyzing data and all the nerdy stuff. Spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So any questions? What do you want to know? Rick? Respect people time if they do have to get somewhere else. So let's thank Susie for her. Yay! I just have like a three hour canvas meeting, so the longer I stay, the better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, folks. Sick, go ahead.